Hey there, Daniel Mitson Short here, and today I have something very special for you. It's an interview that I did a couple of months ago with Mr. Kwong Yu Yang. Uh, many of you would know him from his many Toastmaster semi final and final appearances. He's one of the grandmasters of the game when it comes to the international speech contest. And I had a chance to sit down with him via Zoom and do an interview and talk through his illustrious career as a speech competitor all the way from the early days through his highs and lows and learn some great lessons, not just about speaking, but also about the character of being a competitive speaker and what it takes to keep coming back year after year. So I'm very excited to finally share this interview. It's a couple of months delayed, but here it is for you all my friends. I hope you enjoy. I'm also going to add details about Kwong's contact information below. He has his own YouTube channel and he's worth following on Facebook as well. Always sharing valuable information about speaking and for those of you who are international speech competitors, I really recommend staying in touch with Kwong. So thank you Kwong for being part of this interview series. Really appreciate your insights and your time. And to all of you watching, I hope you enjoy. All right, well, hello everyone. This is Daniel Mitson Short, and I'm very excited today because I have one of my favorite speakers in Toastmasters and a man I've been getting to know over the past couple of years joining me to do an interview and talk about the journey as a speech contestant and the character of what it takes to be a contestant. And that is none other than Mr. Kwong Yu Yang. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. How are things? Everything's good. Everything's going well. I'm very excited to have you on the, the call. I know we've been chatting a bit back and forth and I asked you to do this. So thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. So yeah, so I did this a couple of months ago with Aaron Beverly, who won the world championship in 2019. And I was very interested in his perspective on the character of a competitor, you know, because I've been doing it for many years. and I know you have as well. And, you know, you have one of the most legendary stories, I think, in Toastmasters. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. And the fact we're both fellow Aussies, I couldn't resist. So I <laughs> thought it'd be a great way to, um, to connect. So I have a bunch of questions here. And if you're okay, we'll, we'll go through those. And, and, you know, you answer and share whatever works for you. Sound good? Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. So the first question I had for you was a little bit of the origin story of you joining Toastmasters. You know, when did you first join? Why did you join? And what was your original goal being part of Toastmasters? So it could be a really long story since I've been yeah, in Toastmasters sure. for so long. But the, the origin story started when I worked for Qantas, the, the Australian airline, yes. as you would know. And I was a graduate and the aviation industry wasn't a really good industry to be in at the time. There was SARS, there was uh, terrorism. Nobody really wanted to fly. There were low cost carriers coming in as well. And I was at this town hall or a road trip where executives would come in and talk to us. Right. And the moral, you could tell that the morale of everybody was like, ah, oh, sort of, sort of low. And these executives would come in and they would talk to us. And at the end of that one hour meeting, everybody would come out really positive and feel like, oh, you know, Qantas is the best company to work for. We're in a really good company to be in. We're, we're in a good situation. And I was like, oh, my God, how did he do that? Like, how did he get the audience to go from this level up to here in terms of their spirit? Yeah. And it was just through the way he spoke and communications. And as a graduate, you think, I want to be CEO one day. I need to brush up on my skills. And that's when I joined Toastmasters in a corporate club in Qantas. Right. Now, was that in Australia or in China? No, that was in Australia. That oh, was, was in Australia. In Australia. Okay. And what year was that? I would say around 2005, okay. 2005, towards the end of 2005, 2000, so early 2006. Yeah, amazing. That's, that's very cool. And did you join immediately or did it take you a little while to decide to join? Yeah, it, it took me a while. It was a, it was a lunchtime meeting. Uh, there were a lot of people a lot older than me and I was still quite shy and didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. So I went to a few meetings and sort of sat there and felt awkward before I actually signed up and joined. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such an interesting thing. I think a lot of us, when we go to join Toastmasters, we think everyone's going to be a great speaker and we'll be the worst and they'll all judge us or something. That's why I remember thinking that, you know, and it yeah. couldn't be more reverse. Everyone's so supportive and friendly. 
Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. And what did you have a goal in mind when you first joined? I mean, obviously to maybe, you know, emulate the skills of those people who could motivate and inspire, but was there anything, was it professional, you know, aspirations for you to become a speaker or was it just for better skills for yourself? Or It's just really better skills for myself. I, I just wanted to feel confident speaking in a corporate environment yeah. uh, because growing up as a, a Chinese boy in Australia, I always felt different. So when I was in those situations, I felt really nervous and really tense. So it was really about getting more, more confident. I didn't start thinking about the international speech contest till I think maybe 2008 or 2009. And that, at that time I was already in China. Yeah. So what had happened was the district I was in, we still couldn't compete at the international level. Okay. Uh, I competed in the humor speech contest. Mm -hmm. And the only thing driving me to do the contest was the fact that I could get a free ticket or an excuse to go to Beijing. So I lived in <laughs> South China and I wanted an excuse to go to Beijing. So I just competed in this contest and, and it took me to Beijing and I was like, woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because a lot of people ask me, you know, over the years I've competed, they say, oh, do you win a lot of money when you win the world championship? I say, no, no. But really, it costs you money, you know? <laughs> but that's one example of where you, you, you know, got a benefit beyond just winning a trophy. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so it was humorous that first attracted you. That's, I was actually the same. I don't know if you knew that, but I did the oh. humor contest was my first ever introduction to speech contests and made a complete fool of myself, but it was <laughs> a lot of fun. But you enjoyed it, right? <laughs> yeah, it told me, oh, okay, people will laugh at my jokes. Did you feel the same? Did you know you were a funny speaker before that or? Yeah, it was. It's the same. It's people started laughing, and I was like, "Oh, people are laughing at my jokes. This this feels great." Yeah. And I also had an unfair advantage for my first few years of Toastmasters in China because I was a native speaker. Right. Where else? A lot of the Toastmasters in China at the time, you know, that English is their second language. Yes. So I always felt I had a bit of a unfair advantage. Yeah, I always thought that's an incredible thing. You know, as a native English speaker that people you know, have won the world championship in a second language. I mean, that's incredible to be able yeah. to do that. It's hard enough to actually get there, let alone do it in a second language. So yeah, that's, that's a very good point. So you had a little bit of an advantage there and the accent, of course, too. It doesn't hurt. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's worked for and me yeah, as well. <laughs> exactly, very cool. So then with the international contest, so the humorous was the first experience. And then yep. how did you first hear about the, you know, the international contest and the world championship? What was your first? introduction i think after the humorous contest the year after they said oh we've got table topics we got evaluation contests and they're like apart from these contests what other contests are there and somebody explained oh there's this international contest but right now we we don't have a a path up there because we weren't officially a district we were a provisional district yes uh, so when we did finally have it I think the first year I, I wasn't competing because I was an area director or area governor at the time. And then the year after I, I entered and managed to get to international. So that was 2010. Right. Fantastic. So you got to the semi-final round. Is that right? Was it semi-finals in or did they have regional? Yeah. yeah. No. So that was the first year of semi-finals, I think. Yes. In okay. where, was that, where was that hosted? That was in Palm Springs. Right. Okay. Palm Springs. I remember going, what's Palm Springs? What's that? And, and getting there going, oh, wow. I never knew this existed. Yeah, it's an incredible desert oasis, that place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So you flew from China all the way to the US to compete and yep. that was in 2010. And so what was that experience like that very first year competing in, in the semifinals in 2010? I think it's an experience that most people have who go the, the very first time. And, and you can tell me what experience you had. It's, it's probably very similar. It's like, it's really exciting. You, you feel really nervous because you don't know what you're up against or what to expect. But then deep down inside, you're like, oh, I've got this. You know, I'm, I'm the best speaker <laughs> in the world. I'm, I'm going to win this thing. This is going to be really, really easy. Uh, so there's, there's nerves sort of, but then a part of the other side, there's this confidence inside me. Yes, and exactly. then that, that was experience. <laughs> exactly, and it's funny you say that because I've noticed over the years. You now I've been to the semifinals four times now, and yep. every year I think you and I were talking about this this year. You know, everyone who goes the first year, they've been told by their district the, the entire three months before 
you're going to win. You're the champion and you are the champion in your district. <laughs> so you think I'm the best. You know, even if you're kind of hiding it, you kind of secretly think I'm the best. You know, yep. and, uh, and that's, it's funny you say that because my first year in, this, in the semifinals was 2014, which, uh, yep. and, and I don't know if you recall this, you probably don't, but I met you in Malaysia and I'd been watching your speeches and I walked up and said, oh, Kwong, it's nice to meet you. I'm another Aussie. And I thought, but I have to beat him. I have to beat him. <laughs> I'm going to win. You know? <laughs> no one stands a chance against me. You, know? you get humbled, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a funny experience. It's, yeah, it's just funny. And, and when, you, when, you don't, when you don't do well, yeah, it is very humbling and going, oh, ouch. <laughs> yes. So what was your result? Do you remember your result in 2010? Are you prepared? I didn't get. I didn't get a place. I I don't know where I was, but I know I didn't get a place. And I remember afterwards just being really sour and going, "How could I not get a place? You know, my speech was amazing. It was perfect. It was better than that person's and that person's." Uh, but and I think it took it took me about three or four months afterwards to really learn from the experience and really go, "All right, let me look at my speech and let me really analyze it and see why I didn't win." Yes, absolutely. And, that, you know, I think that's a big part of it is you have to kind of accept the loss. You know, that's, that's one of the things I've learned in Toastmasters, which has helped me a lot in business actually too, is it's very rare in our lives as adults that we just lose. You know, we tend to do things where we play it safe in our career, or our relationships or whatever we're doing in our lives. But in that contest, you're losing in a very public way. You know, up on the, you're just you're not on the stage. You think, hey, I should have won that. So I think it teaches you that character in a way to be like, okay, didn't work out like I thought. Fair enough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that, but yeah, you're, you're definitely right. Yeah, because I mean, that is a reality of anything you try to succeed at, right? You're going to probably fail more times before, you, unless you're just lucky or something. But yeah, I yeah. think for, for you, you know, the exact same situation where it took you a couple of months to actually accept the loss and then to learn from it so then and as you and if you wouldn't mind i wouldn't mind going through the different years you've competed I keep going yeah so so that was 2010 so how did you come back then in 2011 what was your attitude your your mindset difference how did you change so 2011 was really about so first 2011 was about changing my style uh changing my style from what i had in 2010 so 2010 i made up a story about a, a balloon man giving me a red balloon right and it was a fabricated story right. but it took me to, to semi-finals and the feedback was semi-finals was that people couldn't connect or they could tell it wasn't real yeah and so 2011 was a, a bigger focus on trying to tell real stories or stories that happened to me in, in real life mm. and all i wanted to do was the only goal was to get something in semifinals. Right. Was it third place, second place, first place. If I got anything, I would be happy. Right. <laughs> and so when I got first place, I was like, oh my God, I got first. That's fantastic. And then I had to go to the finals and I didn't expect to do that well. I just thought I'm in the finals. I'm just going to give it my best and see what happens. Yeah. And I was the, I was the number one speaker as well. So there's added pressure. So I said, oh, I'm just going to have fun. And yeah. I had fun and I got second. Yes. Yeah. It was a huge, yeah. huge uh, success. So it was amazing. And I think in a way your speech was very iconic purely because of what you said, the fact that you were just willing to share this story, you know, and you were kind of like, what I love about your speaking style is you're very honest about your mistakes, you know, the things that you do wrong very quickly. And everyone can relate to that. You know, I can learn a lot from that. Just, just okay, admit it, you know, <laughs> I messed up or I thought this was going to work and it didn't, you know, and I, I love that about your style and the fact that you had to go from a, you know, a fake story or a fabricated story to learn that is a great lesson, you know, that, hey, just tell the truth, being honest person about what you're doing was it um was it intimidating going from the semis i mean that was your second year right so from the semi round to the final round there's a lot more people in the audience you know the pressure's there because you could win was it was it intimidating or you just said let's have fun don't worry about it yeah it was it was pretty much just have fun don't worry about it there's there's nothing i can really do yeah to to change to change the situation so i should just accept the situation and go for it and do my best yes uh, it also helped that we were in vegas so right. <laughs> my mindset was really relaxed we, you know the, the week before i'd been going to shows and but going shopping so i felt relaxed to to some extent uh 
And I think that helped for that period between semis to finals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. that's a big question I always had, uh, you know, for myself reaching the finals this year was, am I going to be able to handle the pressure? You know, it's so huge being on the final stage and it's, it's the ultimate moment, but it feels very similar in some ways, as long as you don't get in your own head, I think. And, you, you know, you seem to, at least from the outside, I don't know if you are feeling on the inside, you seem to handle that pressure very well every time I've seen you speak. You don't seem to worry too much. I would say it's, it's changed. So the 2011 was just really, wow, this is amazing. I can't, be, I can't believe I'm here. I'm just going to try my best. And whatever, whatever I do it, do, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And because of that, there was practically no pressure. Yes. But if you ask me the same question for what, 2018 or 2014, there was like a different mindset. Right. Well, yeah, so let's jump to that. So did you compete 2013 as well? Yes, I competed in, oh, I competed in 2012. Right. Oh, sorry, 2012, I jumped to you. Yeah, I competed in 2012. I wasn't sure if I was going to, but I did. I got knocked out at uh, District. Right. And I was okay with that because the main... And I don't know if you, if you felt this, but when you, when you get to the final stage and you, you do really well and you get take, you don't win, but then the next year people go, oh, you keep trying, keep trying. Yeah. And for me, deep down, I was like, what happens if I can't make it to the semifinals again? Or what, what if I can't make it even to the final stage? Yeah. I'm going to sort of look worse than before. Yes. And so that was a bit of a fear. So okay. 2012 was really about overcoming that fear. Yeah, so that was 2012. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's a very real fact that happens a lot where you do exceptionally well one year and then the next year you don't, you know, it's just how the contest runs and, and it's very hard to keep creatively coming up with these ideas every single year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 2012 and then 2013, did you compete again? Yep. Competed, got to semifinals. I think that was in Cincinnati and uh-huh. I got, I can't remember if it was third place or second place in my semifinals. Right. And then the winner, Sharuk, went on to the finals and took second or third place. Right. There you go. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So you kept, you kept coming back, which is incredible character just in itself. I always yep. say to people, like, that's, that's the true game of the contest is coming back, being consistent. It's <laughs> really tough. <laughs> and then 2014. So tell me about 2014, Malaysia. That's where I met you briefly and, and saw you. Yep. Sp- yeah, so 2014, got there. I think the goal for that year, were there were two goals. One was I wanted to prove to myself I could get back to the final stage because I did it in 2011. So that was one goal just to get back to the finals. Second reason was because it was in Malaysia, I knew my parents could go to Malaysia and watch yeah. as opposed to if it was in the US. So yeah. that was the other driving force for 2014. Yeah, And I remember getting to the finals and going, all right, I've got a great speech. I've got this in the bag. I'm going to do really well. I delivered my speech. Everybody was laughing. Yes. And I thought, yes, I've got this. I've got this. And I think two speakers later, Dan Jaya came on. <laughs> and he spoke and he blew the audience out of the water. I'm like, oh, he just won. He just won. All right. And yeah. I knew I was defeated. I was like clapping already. It was just a great speech. Yeah, yeah. Isn't isn't it incredible when you um you see, and, uh, and that speaks to your character too, that you see someone, you know, just really grab the audience and you know even more than you that they're going to win. You know, they just have that, that power for whatever reason. It's humbling, yeah. but it's also inspiring in some ways. You think, wow, I didn't know that was possible. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I remember seeing, I saw, actually, I saw your semifinal. I remember it was a late one. It was late in the evening or in uh, Malaysia. I yeah. remember you did amazingly well in that. It really, the crowd was you know, so behind your speech. And then I, I saw Dun and Jay's uh, semi-final as well. I don't know if you saw that one, but um, my friend oh, Cindy, who I actually spoke about. She competed in the same round as him, and mm. she was the speaker just before him. And of course, I wanted her to win. But as soon as he came on in the semi-final round, I thought, "Oh, it's over. It's <laughs> no one else." You know. But interestingly, uh, I was speaking to Dun and Jay recently, and he was saying to me in 2010. He completely froze. I think it was 2010 and one of the early years he was in the semis, he completely froze on the stage in the semifinals as well. So that mm. just shows you the, you know, the journey that you go through as a speaker to really do such an amazing job in 2014, only a few years ago, he was freezing on the stage. You know? I, think, 
I think I saw him in 2013 in his semifinals as well. And I didn't realize it was him. And I remember watching him going, oh, that's, that's a pretty good speech. Yeah. But it's, it's probably not going to win the semis, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and then just to see him in, in 2014 and just like be above so many speakers in so many ways, I was like, wow, he's just improved tenfold. Yes. Yeah, and it's just that evolution, right? But it's the persistence. That's the you know the the whole thing that comes back to. So 2014. So that was your second time coming second. And what I, I really admire about you is that your ability to be humble in defeat as well. You know, and and it's not. And this is the thing I think always frustrates me about Toastmasters. You know, it's the pinnacle is like, oh, this person won and everyone else, you know, came second or came third or didn't place. That's the worst one, right? Didn't place. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're in the, the top 0.1% of speakers consistently in the world. And yet we somehow in our brains think it's not enough. It's not good enough, you know. And how did you deal with that coming second, you know, internally, but also did it, did it affect your life in any way for the coming second for the second time? Um, it it was it definitely wasn't as exciting as as the first time. So the first time, because it was out of my expectations, yeah. it was really exciting. People say, "Oh, you came second. I'm so sorry." I'm like, "I'm so excited that I got second. <laughs> yeah, like, right. I never even thought about it." The second time was different because in my mind, I was like, "I I can do this. I can get first place. I can do really well." Yeah. As I gave myself a little bit more pressure. Yes. And after getting second, obviously, yeah, it's, it, there's a feeling of defeat. And I mean, obviously, I knew I got beaten by a better speech, but I definitely felt a little bit more negative than the first time, which was nothing but positivity. Yeah, yeah. And that's a real thing. You know, a lot of people go through that where they just, for whatever reason, it's not even a reflection of the other speakers. It's, you know, oh, I felt like it was unfair on me or something like that. You know, they go internal. And I've seen that a lot even, you know, at district level or area level where people compete once, their speech doesn't make it through and they think, that's it, I'm done, you know. But it's just that persistence of <laughs> coming back year after year and, and being able to kind of swallow the defeats that makes a difference. So, yeah. so yeah, so 2014, I mean, it was an amazing speech and it, it, was, it was a clear winner in my mind as well. It just, you know, you're competing with another clear winner as well. Yeah. <laughs> what, about, um, what about 2015? Did you compete there? So 2015 was the first year I took a, a break. Right. So I took a break. I wasn't sure if I wanted to compete. I'd spent quite a lot of time. And as you know, it's not just, you don't just start preparing the week before your yes. club contest. <laughs> thinking about it a few months, maybe half a year beforehand. For some people, it's even a year beforehand. And, and then that period from the area contest all the way to international is like three or four months so you're just consumed by the speech for yeah. so long and i've been doing it for like four years or five years and i just said i, I needed a break i didn't have the drive yes and so I off. yeah that's great and did that help you having that year off in just to kind of you know decompress do other things not be around it i think it did i think it just made me just enjoy life a bit more and realize, oh, wow, I can actually go do something during my, my summer and not have to worry about a speech. <laughs> right. And that was relaxing. It was nice. And then it also gave me more hunger the year after or the years after to want to get yeah. back up there. And that, that hunger had gone in, in 2015. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's interesting because I think that's a very good point too is that you don't have to continually compete. You can take time and focus on other things, you know, other types of speaking as well. I've learned that a lot doing, you know, TED Talks, doing professional yep. events, things like that. It's a different type of speaking and it's good for yeah. you. You know, it's healthy, I think. So, yeah. right. Did you, and just on like a little side note, did that start to happen for you too? Were you doing other speaking outside of Toastmasters after those, you know, 2014, 2015? Mm. Around I was getting invited to other districts to speak. And so that was still within a, the Toastmasters ecosystem. Yep. I didn't get, I got one or two things outside of Toastmasters, but because I was in China as well, it's, you know, in, the need for English speakers to do keynotes or to do workshops isn't as big. Right. Makes so sense. I didn't really get that many opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. Um, so, so, so then, if we just continue the story, so twenty sixteen, did you you competed again? 
came back? Yep. Competed in 2016, got to district and lost in the district. Then, yeah, lost in the district in 2016. Yep. Yeah. It happens all, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it, it, it happens, it happens. Yeah, it happens. Uh, and this, this is really good. And this is why I wanted to share this, you know, so people can see this too. This is the reality of what it takes. You know, you that's it. This year's going to be the year. And then, oh, I got to district. Okay. <laughs> so, and then, uh, we're back. yeah. And uh, it's not like you can start again the next week. You have to wait out another six months, you know, and, and that's how yeah. it works in this particular contest. So, yeah. So, um, how was the feeling after that? Were you determined to come back 2017 or? Uh, 2016 wasn't it wasn't too bad so in, in, to, in 2016 I spoke about something where uh, it was it was close to my heart yeah. um, my my dad passed away in 2015 and so I really wanted to talk about a speech in 2016 sort of dedicated to a story between him and me yes. and in a way it was a part of a, a, a healing process mm-hmm. I don't know if it's happened for you but you learn a lot about yourself so sort of writing these speeches and in some ways there's, there's this weird healing process that, go, that you go through reliving all these things. And that, that was really useful for me personally yes. uh, to overcome the tragedy. Of course, because it's very emotional, it's not really a Toastmaster speech that would go to semis or international. And I, in, in my mind, I knew that, yeah. but I just wanted to do that speech. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's so important, you know, it's, I mean, it's exactly what I did in the final, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I knew going into it, you know, I'd been advised by many experienced speakers, this is probably not going to win, you know, and I yeah. said, I need to do this, you know, it was, it was a completion thing for my friends and it was very important. Yeah. I and mean, once it was done, you know, I was, I was happy. I was like, you know what, I did what I meant to do and I can always come back, you know, so, but it's, yeah, yeah you're right. Sometimes you need to do those for yourself and for the people you love. It's very important. So that's yeah, great. exactly, exactly. And, and I believe you're in, tw- in 2017. You were in Vancouver because I was there too. You, you competed there. Yes, yeah. I was. Yep. I was in Vancouver, and then I lost in the semis to Minaj, who then yep. went on to win the contest in, in Vancouver. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, you, uh, did you? Did you feel? Was it a year where you kind of felt like you know? Okay it was deserved or were you frustrated or cause you'd been doing it for quite a while then how were you starting to feel at that time? Uh, that year I thought I had an okay speech for the semis. I wasn't hundred percent confident with it, but I thought it was, it was pretty good. Yeah. But I also felt like I was in the semifinal of death. So it's, I don't know every now and then there are the semifinals <laughs> of death. Yes. And I had Minaj, I had, uh, I just had a few people who'd been to the world stage before in, in my studies. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, come on, why? Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. I remember that same year, Aaron was in the same semi as um, Aditya and then a couple of other people who'd been in the, the world championships as well. And so we're like, someone's got to go. You know, it was, <laughs> it, was, it was really, it wasn't a nice feeling because we're like, oh, you know, we all yeah. want, want to go, you know. So, yeah, that's a good way to say it. Semi-final of death. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. I think that, that year there were two or three and it was just like, ah, oh, whoever yeah. survives that is, is going to be really lucky. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So that was my, that was just in terms of context, that was only my third time competing at the semi-final level. Um, so, and I came second that year in the semi-finals. And that was the first time I remember personally feeling that, okay, I can accept this you know what, it's okay. You know, it took me until then. So that was 2014, 2015, and then 2017. I finally was like, okay, we'll be back, you know. <laughs> so it takes a few years just to get to that point where you can kind of still the water, you know, the, the frustration. Or, you know. It's okay, but, it's good. I should yeah. be happy about this. Yeah, and then I actually enjoyed myself at the conference instead of just, you know, raging about it in my hotel room or whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> as we do. So that was 2017 for you. And then 2018, I know you made it back to the, the finals. Yep, 2018, made it back to the finals. And... I had a speech in my pocket, which I knew that if I delivered it really well, I would get top three. Yep. Uh, just because I've been through the contest so often, I knew that the speech I had could get me the top three. And it was the speech I used in a semifinal, maybe in 2014. I think so. That, yes, I remembered it. Yeah, that, yeah. that acupuncture. And uh the rehearsals the night before didn't go as smoothly uh, as I had hoped, mm-hmm. and that 
translated into stumbles in the finals, mm -hmm. which, yeah, just made me lose my rhythm. And the, people told me I went over time, which is possible. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that was probably my hardest defeat out of all the years. Yeah. Because in previous years, I lost this fine, but that, that year when I lost, oh, uh, as soon as I finished my speech, I walked off stage and I just sat in the back, in the backstage and I was just like head down, almost crying. I, I think I cried because it was just, I was just really upset with myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's really tough when you don't deliver what you feel you could do. You know, it's, that's, that's one of the toughest things I think, you know, cause you, you have an expectation of what you want to achieve, but then and everyone else admires it, but you, you know, when you made a mistake, right? The audience doesn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, and I went through exactly the same. I froze on the stage and in you know the finals out of emotion, and that was my best joke in the speech. Was right then I messed it up, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> but it's on, it's on in a record forever now. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just made a fool of myself in front of three thousand people and other people and watching live, but. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, one of the things that, that has taught me, I don't know if you feel the same is every audience is very forgiving, you know, so you, it doesn't matter if you mess up like that. And I think, you know, I probably froze worse than you. I don't remember in 2018, you really messing up too much, but the audience doesn't know. And even if they do, they, they're on your side, you know, so they're never going to be throwing a tomato at you or something. <laughs> you know, there's none of that. It's they're, they're with you, you know, and that was a really good reminder for me. Of, okay. I can't really mess this up no matter what, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. The audience is really nice, especially Toastmasters audience. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a difference. If you speak professionally, they may not be as interested or as engaged, but Toastmasters, bless them, they you know they're always on your side, which is really it's good to know if you're a new Toastmaster. So, yeah. with the, so there we go. So 2018. So that was a tough you know loss, or, or you felt like it wasn't your best. Um, and then coming into 2019, what was the mindset? What was the the focus? The mindset for 2019 was and similar to Aaron's is, is the idea of redemption and just trying to tell myself I did really badly last year. I just need to prove to myself that I can make the final stage again yep. and just deliver a great speech because I have done such a bad job the year before that I didn't want that to be the ending chapter of, of this Toastmasters career or this competing yep. sort of career. So I wanted to at least have something that was positive towards the end. And yeah. that was the focus for 2019. Yeah. And how did it feel being on the stage? Because you were first speaker again, I know, and it was a smaller group this time than it's ever been. What yep. was the difference for you? Or, and even the semifinals was a different setup, right? With the three winners instead of yeah. one, the second, third. How did it, did it feel different for you in any way this year? Yeah, it felt different in, in many ways. Uh, with, so if we first talk about the semifinals, having less semifinals was this weird feeling because previously we would have, what, 9, 10, 11, 12 semifinals. Maybe 100 people in the room for the brief. Yeah. yeah. By the end of that day, everybody would be exhausted of listening to speeches because there have been so many speeches. Uh, this year there, there wasn't that feeling, but... During the semi-final, there were a lot more people in each semi-final room. Yeah, yeah. Right. Everybody was there, and there's a lot more people, and the standard was was really really high. Yeah. For both semi-finals, so I would I would feel like the standard of the contest felt more competitive or felt higher because you just and and you had more people as well. So the feeling of the semi-final felt different. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I can agree with that. <laughs> and it was also, it, being part of it was actually quite friendly. I, I thought it was going to be like, you know, sudden death round, like you were saying before, everyone's going to be dead serious. And everyone was quite friendly, you know. It was, it was yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. It was easier to connect with people because just, I think it was six people in the semifinals. Yeah. Six actually people. have a conversation yeah. Yeah. And, and talk to people. Where else, when there's 10, then you have some people sort of, yeah. I don't know talk to them some people are like i'm gonna win this <laughs> yes yeah it felt yeah. very different what is that person in the semi-finals who's just there to win you know that <laughs> and i've been that person too so i'm yeah. not criticizing but they just head down they don't want to talk you know and that's like you know you're like okay cool i'll leave one you know <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's, that's very cool. And then for the final this year, what, what was your feeling? So you came third in the final. What was the you know, emotion of that and, and what was your takeaway? So getting third, the feeling of me getting third in the finals in 2019 was pretty close to the feelings I had in 2011. Right. So just a relief, just so happy to be able to get something, just excited that I was able to be up there and to entertain the audience yeah. and know that I had a connection with the audience. Yes. And that was a great feeling. And so even though I didn't get first, getting a place and just having that feeling of delivering my speech the way I wanted to deliver it and the way I envisioned it was so satisfying. Yes. It was really satisfying. And so that would be similar to the feeling I had 2011. Very yeah. cool. So it sort of came full circle in a way. You know. Yeah. It yeah. sort of came full circle, which yeah. is why it's just it's just feels like a real it felt like a really good feeling and i i did have some issues the night before trying to work out which speech i was going to use but finally being able to choose the speech and deliver it was yeah it was just great i mean that that in itself is a massive testament to your skill that you had two speeches you were thinking of delivering in the final <laughs> you're like oh, which one i don't you know i mean most of us have been working on it for months this one speech you know it's all in you were, oh, okay, which one? You know, <laughs> itself is just, you know, you can take the pressure. You can, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, the, the rookie's coming in to, to play with Michael Jordan. He's like, I got this. You know, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very cool. Well, the thing I've always admired about you is um, that you have the same personality and, you know, you are the same person on the stage as off the stage. I mean, I as a speaker tend to be a little bit more amplified, you know, when I'm on the stage, I'm a little bit more loud or kind of whatever but I, I feel like you're literally the same person you know and <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's I mean because I remember talking to you 10 minutes before you went on and you know you're talking to me exactly the same as you are to the audience when you get on a stage in front of 2,000 people is that something you've had to learn or is that just you know how you are as a speaker or what do you think I think it's something I've had to learn and something that I'm more comfortable with now yes. so if you if you look back at 2011 and fortune cookie, then it's actually the energy is much higher. Right. I, I amplify the energy. There's a lot more body language. Whereas in 2019, the way I deliver is, is slightly different. I, my hands are a little, a little closer. Yeah. I'm not as energetic, which was, I know some people have said to me, oh, you should have brought more energy to the finals. And I'm like, that's not my style anymore. Like that was what it was in 2011. And over time, my, my delivery style has changed mm, yeah. over, over a time period. I always become more integrated with, your, with who you really are. Yeah, we're integrated with who I am. And I'm also more comfortable with you know, the, the way I want to present myself. Yes. On yeah. stage. Yeah. And that just comes with time, don't you think? It's yeah. not something you can teach, really. You just have to do it many times. Yeah, it, it just comes with time. I mean, if you think about people who deliver workshops, like the first workshop, they're all you know, pretty rigid and pretty trying to remember all the content. But then people have delivered workshops every single day or a couple of times a year. After a while, they just become more natural. and like, all right, I know what my content is. I just want to connect with my audience. I just want to interact with them. And it just becomes more natural. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's almost like when you're first learning to drive, you know, all the mechanics that you have to remember of, you know, how to change gears or steer or look at the mirrors or whatever, that all goes away. Same, same as with speaking. After a while, you're like, I know how to do a gesture. I know how to raise my foot, <laughs> whatever. You know, you don't have to think on those things. You can just connect. And it's almost like you're just getting to the destination and enjoying it, you know, as you're going. So, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very cool. Very cool. Well, so the last question I have for you, and this is something I'm just interested in as, as yep. a person, is what I really admire too is the persistence and the character it takes to keep coming back. And trust me, I, I feel it. I've been right there with you where you're like, okay, let's do it again. You know, and as you said, it, like the whole summer, basically from February through to August, your life is just practicing, 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 rewriting. That's all you do. And to put ourselves through that is a, it's a special form of insanity. You know, it's not for the, for the light of heart, I would say. But what is it that drives you the most? What do you feel, you know, why do you keep doing it? What is it that you've, you know, 
you, you, what's your what's your motivation, I suppose, underneath now? So I don't know where it, when it started developing, but I think that for me, every year, I have a a goal, and it's like more of a personal goal. It's not necessarily win the world championship. It's yes. What do, what do I want to do this year with with my speech? So in, in 2014, the goal was to speak in Malaysia so that my parents could watch me. Yeah. 2019 is really about redemption and making sure I could get back to where I thought I was. Yeah. Uh, 2016 was talking talking about my dad. So every year there's sort of some other emotional goal that that drives me because. Mm-hmm. If it's just the world championship, that's not enough to push me for five or six months yeah. and do it 10 years in a row. That would be re- It's just not enough for me anyway. It's yeah. not enough of a motivation uh, yeah. because it just gets so tiring. Yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense. It's a great point too because I've noticed particularly in 2019, my motivation was totally different than it ever been to do the speech for my friends. And it drove me in a different way. You know, I didn't want to give up as easily. I wanted to work harder. You know, there was something else behind it and totally different feeling for me than I've ever had. So it's it's very true. And I think that only comes on board if you keep doing it for a while, right? You have to realize that (laughs) you're probably not going to win in the first year. I mean, it has been done. Some people do it. But generally speaking, you're going to be around for a while and, you know, you've got to keep persisting. Um, Do you have any final thoughts in terms of the character of what it takes to be a competitor? You know, not necessarily the skills as a speaker, but just the character. In terms of the character, I think, I think A, you need to know what's driving you to want to achieve whatever goal it is yep. that you want to achieve. And the second thing is to probably... Not necessarily be humble, but have that charisma to show that you want to share. Yeah. That you want to share. Because if you think about all the ch- champions who have won, they're all really nice people. I'm not saying that none of the, I mean, all competitors are probably really nice people. Yeah. But if you think about the champions who have won, they usually, they have this certain type of charisma to them. And yeah. I don't, I, I can't explain it by words. Maybe you, know what i'm talking about and you you can verbalize it Um, yeah 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 it's it's um i think it's only one through persistence you know that's that's that character that (laughs) that charisma that they have you know it comes online because i do remember um talking to dan and jaya very briefly in 2014 before he spoke at the semis i just was happened to be standing in the same area he was sitting you know and we just talked for a minute. And he was so chilled. He was just relaxed, you know, just <laughs> hanging out. And, you know, because he'd been there so many times. And I, I knew for him it wasn't such a big deal. But that yeah. character had sort of fully formed by that stage, you know. So yeah. you're right. It was a charisma. I can't explain it. But it's, it's like a magic that comes to you only through persistence. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, sir, I really appreciate the time and, and the insights. Now, um, do you, uh, I don't know if you have like a sort of, you know, professional speaking that you're pursuing outside of Toastmasters or anything that you want to kind of share or promote like that, that people would want to know about you? I, I, yeah, probably. I, sh- I should have. You wouldn't think over 10 years I would have <laughs> designed something or had a book or some audio thing over 10 years. And I've never put myself in, in those shoes to do that. Yeah. But this year at some point in time, I think I'm going to start releasing sort of some online content, some things that people can pay to join and either small groups or, or videos just to share some thoughts because it's, it's 10 years of information all, all up in, in my brain. Absolutely. And I need to sort of download it all in a digestible way. Yes. And I hope I can do it in a condensed way so that people can enjoy it. So it will be coming. Hopefully first half of this year fantastic well i'm excited i'm looking forward to hearing and learning more about it so well thank you again for the time and uh if anyone i'm sure people can follow you on facebook or, or get in contact if they you know want to say hello yep. in that way but i appreciate your sportsmanship and your character and especially your you know your speaking skill i really admire it so thank you for for thank being you. a a symbol of what we should all be as speakers 
So there you are, my friends. That's the full interview with Kuang Yu Yang. Hopefully it taught you something new that you can take away and use in your own quest towards the World Championship of Public Speaking or in anything that you're trying to do in the world of public speaking. Kuang is a real master, not only at the game of Toastmasters contest, but just speaking in general. So again, I really recommend checking out his YouTube channel. He offers great insights and advice and also following him online because he has a lot to share. Thanks once again, Kwong, for being part of the interview. Really appreciate your time and your insights. And thank you for watching. I'll catch you soon.